Hello, today I'm going to be going over creating and submitting jobs on Discovery. First off, what is a job? A job consists of all the data, commands, scripts, and programs that's going to be used to obtain results. Jobs are either batch jobs or interactive jobs, but have two main components. A description of requested compute resources and a set of actions to run those resources. A common mistake for new users is to run heavy workloads directly on the login node, such as Discovery or Endeavor. Unless you are doing a quick test, please make sure to run your program as a job. If left running, the process may be terminated without warning. So the first step is it must go through a job scheduler once you create the job. The job scheduler consists of taking the shared resources and managing those shared resources in a way that's fair for all the users. It allocates the compute resources on the clusters for queued user-defined jobs. The job also depends on your project account allocations, and each job will subtract from your project's allocated core hours. You can see your core hours using the myaccount command. Here, we can see the usage in CPU minutes. However, you will also be able to see it on percentage of total on your account. Also be able to go into the user portal to see your current usage. To get started, let's look at our first batch job. Here, I've loaded a script called example.job. I'm using Vim. However, you can use any text editor that you find comfortable. Here, we can see several different sections of the code. What it does is it launches a Python script. The advantage of a batch job is that it doesn't require any human intervention to run properly. Once you let it run, it will submit all your commands and it will request the resources that are needed. The main advantage of a batch job is they don't require any human intervention to run properly. Once submitted, it will request resources and submit the commands as needed. The top line, hashtag exclamation mark slash bin slash bash, specifies which interpreter to use. The bash interpreter is specified, so everything in the script should be using the bash syntax. The next few lines, sbatch, followed by a flag, uses options to specify the requested resources for your program. Be sure to use the correct account ID where it says dash dash account equals your account ID. Without the dash dash account option, your default account will be used. This is fine if you only have one project account. However, if you have multiple projects, then you may run into errors. The next set of lines, module load, loads the GCC and the Python modules. Finally, the Python script, Python 3 space script.py is the command that runs your program. The first line, end tasks, specifies the number of tasks to one. CPUs per task equals eight, specifies the number of CPUs each task has. The time sets the upper limit, and the memory per CPU is set to two gigabytes. Once we exit, we can submit the job with the command sbatch my.job. Finally, once the job is finished running, it should come out in a file that looks like slurm-number.out. That number is your job ID. Next, we'll be going over how to run a job on the Endeavor cluster. I have an example job script called endeavor.job. Here, most of the commands are pretty much the same, except the dash dash partition flag. The partition and the account matters because it specifies your account ID for your Endeavor condo allocation, as well as the partition ID. If you encounter an error similar to job submit slash allocate failed, invalid account or account partition combination specified, please contact us at crc dash condo at usc.edu 
to obtain the correct account ID slash partition combination. Again, the command sbatch submits a job script. Furthermore, once you submit that job script, you can look at the status of the cluster using sinfo, and you can also look at the status of your job using sq u followed by your username. Here we can see the job ID followed by the partition it's running on, followed by the username, the time, the amount of nodes it's requested, as well as which nodes it is running on. ST, where it says PD, is the current state of the job. And the name is the name of the job, which you can specify with a dash J flag. For more information, please look at the Slurm documentation as well as our website at crc.usc.edu. Another useful command is the s cancel. If you do the s cancel command, followed by your job ID, you can cancel your job. Another useful command is a salad command. It is useful for running interactive jobs. This is so that you can test or run jobs that require user input or interaction. Here we're requesting the users and the resources in the same way. Here we can see the job ID queued and waiting for resources. And then you should be able to start And then you should be able to start And then you should be able to start testing out scripts programs to make sure that they work properly. Once you're confident that you know your pro how your program will behave, you're ready to submit a job through Slurm. Here, we're at the same directory, but now we are on the interactive node. Now we can run jobs freely without worrying about blocking up the resources. Let's exit. Oh, another thing that I forgot to mention is that you can use the sq command to estimate when your job will start using this command. Next, let's look at single-threaded jobs. Let's open up another example job script that I've got. One thing to note is that the default value for the nodes is one, and the default values for the number of tasks is also one. The number of nodes should be increased if you're running a parallel job using MPI, but otherwise it should remain unchanged. The number of tasks should be increased if you're running a multi-node parallel job. The CPUs per task is the one you will want to explicitly change depending on the nature of your job. Most nodes on the main partition have 24 cores each, so typical values will be 8, 16, or 24 for multi-core parallel jobs. Note that serial jobs only require one core. Here we can see the number of CPUs per task is 1 because it is single-threaded. Let's look at a multi-threaded job. Here we can see the number of CPUs is increased to 8 instead of 1. The number of threads of memory that can be used depends on the available compute nodes that can be used. In the main partition on discovery, the compute nodes have a maximum of 24 threads, 92 gigabytes of memory each. On the EPYC-64 partition, the compute nodes have a maximum of 64 threads and 248 gigabytes each. Be sure to modify the CPUs, the memory, as well as the time option as needed. 
and be sure to modify your programs or script if needed to use the resources requested. Requesting a lot of resources may also result in longer queue times. Since some programs may use OpenMP for multi-threading. Next, let's look at an MPI job. Here we can see the dash J flag used to name this job. Further no furthermore, the number of nodes is increased to six, and the number of tasks is increased to 144. The number of CPUs here is one, and the time is given 24 hours. The module is purged and then loads USC just as a safety, safety measure. And then U limit gets rid of the system limit on the resources that are able to be used. Next, it passes the number of threads to MPI, changes directories back to where you submitted your job, and then runs your program. For more detailed information, please visit crc.usc.edu on how to compile, run, as well as the basics of parallel programming. Next, let's look at a multi-threaded MPI job. Here we can see some interesting things. The number of CPUs has been increased, and there is a constraint on the CPU. Furthermore, for this program, we're going to be loading different things just for the script. Furthermore, you're also passing the number of threads to OpenBLAST because we're loading it, presumably for the script. When running multi-threaded jobs, make sure to also link the multi-threaded libraries and vice versa. Links single-threaded libraries to single-threaded MPI programs. For optimal performance, especially in the case of multi-threaded parallel programs, there are additional arguments that must be passed to the program. Finally, let's look at an array job. An array job allows you to use a single job script to launch multiple jobs to do something similar. For example, if you want to run the same program but have it read different input files, it makes use of the slurm array ID environment variable. Here, the requested resources reflect the needed resources for the actual program. However, assuming you have input files named similar to input 1, 2, dot dot dot, etc., and assuming that a program called my program takes options input file and output file to specify the paths to the input and output files, we can use the slurm array ID to pass it to the program. In this case, slurm array ID will take on the values specified in the dash dash array option. Here, one through 10. Make sure the resources you request are sufficient for one individual job, not the array as a whole. Next, let's look at requesting GPUs. Here, we see one thing that is particularly different at the top, the dash dash GRE's GPU, and then followed by a number. Here we see K40 colon one, however, it can be replaced with just a number. That number represents the number of GPUs per node requested. And then the GPU type can also be specified here. We have Nvidia Tesla K20, K40, K80, which is specific to Condo, P100 and V100 models. Each one besides the K80 has a max number of G two GPUs per node. The K80 has four GPUs per node. Otherwise, it is mostly the same. That should hopefully get you through the basics of submitting and creating jobs. If you have more questions or would like to find out more, please visit us at crc.usc.edu. You can also contact us through the website for more detailed questions as well as help running your job. Thank you.